Good morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this time together. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you've given this this gift of the church, Lord, of of your body that we could be a part of. And I thank you for that reminder that you've given us. You've given us such an incredible gift as you've united us together with your spirit. So, Lord, I pray this morning that that you would speak to us through that spirit, that you would guide us through your word and that you would teach us something new, that you would you would let us leave this place changed all the more as we open your word and we're led by your spirit. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. I know I already said that, but good morning anyway. I'm going to say it a couple more times, I'm sure. I'm going to talk about something that everybody loves to talk about, which is preaching styles. Everybody loves talking about preaching styles, right? That's No, I know that's going to bore people to tears. As a matter of fact, I was told by one person as they came in, not, I, I was warned not to put them to sleep because they hadn't been sleeping well. So um, I apologize. If you need to take a nap, go ahead. I'm not offended. Man, not near enough laughs on that. Please don't fall asleep. Uh, there we go. Okay. Well, the way that I preach, most of you guys know how I do things now. Most of you know how I like to walk through a passage. And honestly, my preaching style was, was primarily shaped by, by, one, by one man, um, was primarily shaped by a professor I had at Midwestern Seminary in Kansas City. Um, he actually wrote books on preaching and the different styles and the way people should preach. And, and I'm not saying that there is one right way to preach. I think that's really arrogant to say. But the way that I preach was largely shaped by him. Um, and I think now about before I spent time at Midwestern, because I, I preached several times before I ever went to school to, to study this. Um, <laughs> and I just thought back to the way that I, I used to preach. And, you know, I'm not saying there was anything wrong with it, but the way I look at it was kind of like theological word vomit. Um, you just kind of get up and you just keep throwing theological truth out there and you hope something sticks. Um, there was really no method. There was no structure. It was just throw it out there and hope something good happens, which I'm not saying that's wrong. I, I know that I like a little more structure in things, and I, I learned as I went that maybe people receive that better if there is a little bit of structure to it. Um, but basically what I would do before is I just tried to throw some cute stories out there along with the Bible passage and just try to tie the two together. Honestly, it was more about how can I tie this cute story into God's Word than preach God's Word, and if there's a cute story that goes along with it, fine, just do that. Um, But I never thought twice about, should you preach a topical sermon? Should you preach expository, open God's word and just teach what the Bible says? I never thought twice about it. Like it never crossed my mind until I started studying it. Um, But now, even though, like I said, the way that I preach is primarily shaped by one man at Midwestern, there, there are some other influences to that, the other preachers that I listen to regularly, and I didn't realize that they had a similar structure to the way that they preach until I heard somebody talk about the way that they preach. Um, so I had never given a second thought to it. So while I may be primarily influenced in my style by one man, certainly I'm influenced by those others also. And now I can, at times I say things, I'm like, man, I hear that person saying this. Like I can hear somebody else saying this. And I know that it's influenced that way. But what I know for sure is that my style is drastically different from what we see Peter do in Acts chapter 2. Drastically different. Like, I I look at Peter's sermon and I think, man, I could never preach Peter's sermon. Of course, literally what we're doing that I'm going to do today is preach Peter's sermon. But we'll do it a little bit differently than the way that Peter does it. Maybe that's a bad idea because Peter saw some serious results when you see 3,000 people saved at the end of it. So, uh, it's certainly different. And even though it's different, there are still some elements that as I looked at this from somebody who studied um, homiletics, has studied preaching, like the actual method of preaching, after studying, there's still some of these elements that are visible in Peter's sermon. Like, I started looking at Peter's sermon, I started breaking it down, and and I saw that there are actually three distinct movements in Peter's sermon. Like, it's almost like he preached a three-point sermon right here. In Acts chapter 2, and I thought, boy, some of these professors are really smart. They're coming up with these really good structures. And it's like, Peter did it 2,000 years ago. This is nothing new. Like, so, so today, what I want to do as we look at this, I want to show you these three movements. I want to show you these three movements in Peter's sermon. So basically what I want to do is I want to I preach Peter's sermon to you today. Okay. Now, if we have 3,000 people saved, pray, praise Jesus. If we have one person saved, praise Jesus. If, 
if we grow deeper in his love and his grace, praise Jesus, I'm good with all of it. But I want to show you those three distinct movements, those three distinct sections. And from those, I'd like to give you four exhortations today, and we'll get to those here closer to the end. Um, But you know, I told you that this is, in Acts chapter 2, we see four different parts to Acts chapter 2, right? And I wanted to preach them all as one sermon, and I was kind of tempted to to combine all three of the last three again, because I really want to get to where we see 3,000 people saved and baptized, but I thought maybe we need to slow down just a little bit. So today, last week we saw the strength of the gospel. It was in the power of the Holy Spirit. Today I want you to see the substance of the gospel that Peter preaches. I want you to see what it is that he talks about, what that substance is, and next week we're going to look at the response and the result Lord willing. So if y'all would stand with me, let's read God's word together. We're going to read from Acts chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 14 and go through 36. God's word says, Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, fellow Jews and all you residents of Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me in Hades, or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the paths of life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence." Brothers and sisters, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord declared to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Thank God for his word. You may be seated. Whew. Now that's a lot. That's a lot. It is. But I want to show you these three movements as we walk through this. And I want to show you the substance of what he was preaching. I want to show you that really what he is doing, he is preaching Jesus in the scriptures. That's what he's preaching. He's preaching that Jesus is the answer. He's showing that Jesus was there from the beginning. He's showing Jesus here in the scriptures. So movement number one, movement number one. He explains the spirits moving among them. Peter explains the spirits moving among them. Okay, so here, the first thing we see as we hit verse 14, keep in mind, let's just just remember where we are, okay? The Holy Spirit has just come at Pentecost. They've just been filled with the Holy Spirit. They start speaking in tongues, and there's this big scene, and all of these Jewish people who are here in town, they start gathering around to see what this commotion is. They start coming around, and they're thinking, what in the world's going on? The last thing that happened was some of them were sneered, Sneering, saying, well, no, these people are just drunk. They're not really experiencing God's power. They're just drunk. And I know I promised you a joke. We'll get there in a minute. So the first thing we see, though, in verse 14 is Peter actually starts to lay hold of his calling. 
He starts to cling to his calling, and he starts to take ownership of that. Because we think about who Peter is, and to this point, he has not exactly been the perfect example of what a Christian is supposed to be, has he? He hasn't exactly been the strongest in his resolve. He's been, I remember I called him impulsive Peter at one point. It was like he just, he's always impulsive. And then the last time we saw Peter before Jesus came back was, well, Peter was, he was cussing, saying, no, I don't know this Jesus. He was denying him. We just saw that. And that was just months earlier, just a couple of months before this happens. So Peter in verse 14, is the one who stands up among the 11. It's Peter who stands up. Okay, now that's important because he hasn't been the perfect example, but clearly Jesus had set him apart for something big. We know Jesus set him apart, not only whenever Jesus restores Peter to, to his apostolic calling, not only whenever he does that does he say, feed my sheep, not only does he say, take care of my flock, not only does he say that, you think back even to Matthew, verse 16, Sorry, chapter 16, verse 18, it says this. He says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. He just told Peter that you're going to be a rock that I'm going to build my church on. And the same Peter, not long after Jesus says that, is denying Jesus multiple times. He's, he says he goes off and he's cursing and he's swearing, and he's just, he just says, No, I don't even know him. That's the Peter that we're seeing here. But Peter was told, you will be this rock. But here we see Peter stepping up and taking charge, taking hold of the calling that God has given him. How does he do that? It's certainly not on his own because we've seen he fails miserably on his own. It's important that this happens right after the Holy Spirit comes and fills them. So now God is supernaturally empowering Peter to go and take charge of the calling that he's given him. Now we get this mixed up a lot of times because we think God's called us to do something, so we have to go do it. I think that's a horrible way of looking at things. Instead, God gives us a call, and then what he's going to do is he's going to come and fill us, and he's going to supernaturally empower us to fulfill whatever he's called us to. And that's exactly what we see here with Peter. Peter finally realizes this is what God has called me to, and it's going to happen, but it only happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we see this different Peter. This isn't that weak Peter. This isn't that impulsive Peter. What this is, is this is a Peter who is, who is bold, and he's confident, and he's unashamed of Jesus. And he steps up, and he begins to speak. He steps up. And it says that as he does this, basically what he's doing, now remember who the people who gathered around are. These are Jewish people. So these are people who believed in the God of the scriptures. Peter is literally feeding God's sheep. He's caring for that flock. He is caring for those people who are now gathered around. And as he does, he's among these Jewish people, and it says that he stands up. Now that seems like it's just it's not a big deal. Okay, so he stands up to speak. But it would have been a big deal at this time. These are Jewish people. You go to a Jewish service on the Sabbath, what would happen is they would stand, they would read God's word together, and then the teacher would be seated and teach from a seated position. So for him to stand up to teach the people was different. This would have caught their attention. It would have been strange to them. But it was important that he did that because what Peter is essentially saying by standing up is that I'm not a Jewish rabbi. I'm not this Jewish teacher. Instead, I'm going to tell you something to do. And instead, I'm just going to proclaim that this Jesus is the one that you need to go to. That's what he starts to do here. It's, it's completely different. Instead of saying, I'm going to teach you about this God who came and created things, I'm going to point you to this one. One commentator said this is more of a herald than a teacher. He's, he's proclaiming that there is a Messiah, that he is here. It's not the same kind of teaching that you would have seen otherwise. I love it. I, I, it's almost as if he's giving, instead of giving this lecture that you would expect to get, instead of giving this lecture, he's, he's giving an invitation. It's, it's a completely different dynamic. And then everybody's favorite verse, I know it was certainly mine, and every time I read it, I just, I kind of chuckle a little bit. He tells them to pay attention to his words, and then in verse 15 he says, For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. 
And I can't help it. I just can't. Maybe I'm just immature. Maybe that's what that is. But I read that and I just kind of chuckle. And the reason I do is because the first ever explicitly Christian sermon recorded in history starts out with these people aren't really drunk. I, I, I can't come up with a better joke than that. That's as good as I can do. Okay, so maybe I lied in saying I'd give you a joke, maybe, but that's, that's the best it gets, man. I just can't help it. But what he's saying is, this isn't what you think. This is something different. These people aren't drunk. It's only 9 in the morning. It would have been out of custom for them to have any kind of alcohol at this point in the day. So he's saying, no, 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 no. we're not drunk. This is God's power. And then he begins to explain what's really going on in verse 16. In verse 16, he says, on the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. So he says, these people aren't drunk. What's happening is the scriptures are being fulfilled. And you don't even see it. See, and he starts pointing them to something that would have been common to them. These are Jewish people. They would have known the scriptures. He points them back to the scriptures. He points to Joel and says, look, God told you that this was going to happen. He told you this was going to happen. He told you that the Spirit of God was going to come. This was something that not just Jesus said, but this was something that prophets were saying years ago, hundreds of years ago. We saw Joel say that the Spirit's going to be poured out. This is going to happen. Why are you not expecting this? God told us this would happen. And the first thing he does is points them to Scripture. He points them to Scripture. In case you're curious, he's quoting here from Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And there is one word actually a few words here that he, he adds in to, to, to give them context, to make it clear what's going on. Verse 17 says, And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out the Spirit on all people. In the last days. Why is it that Peter calls us the last days, yet we're still here 2,000 years later? Why is that? Was he really in the last days? Well, the Bible says it, so it must be true. That's what a lot of Christians will say. But what does that really mean? In the last days. Of course he was in the last days. I actually read a couple different commentaries that said different things, and I think one was right, and I think the other one was close. Was close. Literally, what this, this last days is, is a time frame. It's a period of time. It's not like it's, a few days, it is an, an era. We think back and we think before Jesus came, there was an era. Actually, there were several eras in that time where God gives his promises. And throughout time, he continues to give promises. And here we see that God has fulfilled these things. He has come once, and we are between these times where he comes once and he comes again. And this is the era that they are referring to as the last days. We live in the last days, just as Peter says, here in the last days, these things will happen. So in this time that, that called the last days, in this period, he says a lot of things are going to happen. A lot of things are going to happen. But one of those things is that the Spirit of God will be poured out on all flesh. The Spirit of God is going to be poured out. And the New Testament refers to this period of the last days over and over and over and over again. But literally what he says here is that the Spirit is going to pour out, or another word could be gush or run greedily, like it just pours out. God isn't going to withhold himself from you. He just pours out his spirit. It just gushes out. It is running greedily on all people. And the point that he's kind of driving at here as we look at this is that God's powers, God's spirit is going to empower all people. All people. And he goes on to make it very clear that this isn't just one people group or, or one gender or one age. He points that this is universal, like all people. It is all there. As you read through this, he says all flesh, which literally points us to me the meaning that this is all nationalities, all people groups. So it's not like you're American, so you get the spirit of God. But if you live over here, you don't. That's, that's not the case. It is all people, regardless of nationality. He says regardless of gender, as he says sons and daughters. Later on in verse 18, he's going to say men and women. Then he goes on to say that the Spirit of God is going to be poured out regardless of age. He says young men, old men, all of those people will receive God's Spirit. And he even says regardless of your social status. He says even servants will receive God's Spirit. Even servants. Now, we all say we believe that, but practically, do we live that? 
I know that there have been times where I've been like, yeah, I know that God pours his spirit out on all who receive Jesus in faith. I know that. Like, mentally, I know that. But practically, I don't live that. Because it seems as if if there's a person of another social status, we have this tendency to be like, well, I just, I don't know, I don't have anything in common, so I'm not going to take the gospel to them. Or if it comes up, then I'll take the gospel to them. Like if there's a, but we all know that practically, because we live in different social statuses, because we live in different areas, we're never going to have that interaction with them. We know that, and we don't intentionally take it to them. But here, Jesus, or Jesus, here, God says that his spirit is intended for all people. And if that's the case, we should take his gospel to all people, to everyone. The gospel is not for one people, one social group, one gender, one age. It is for everyone. And then he gives the only requirement. There is one requirement for receiving this spirit. In verse 21, one requirement. It says, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. One thing that has to be done, right? That's all he says here. Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. So, if I was to go around this room and ask you one by one, saying, okay, every single one of you is separated from God, from the God who created all things. You are separated him from him forever, like forever. You will be eternally separated from him. Do you want to be saved from that? Everybody says yes. If you don't say no, then you're lying, okay? Or if you say no, then you're lying. Everybody says yes. Everybody says yes to that. So if that's the case, what does it say about us if we don't take the gospel that can save those people? What what does it say if we don't take them the gospel that can save them? Everybody wants to be saved from this sin. And we have the one requirement, the one thing that it takes to be saved. It says right here in God's word, and this is a quote from earlier on in God's word. So it says it twice throughout the Bible. Actually, it says it a lot more than that, but at least twice, and we know it from this one passage, says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We have the one requirement. What does it say about us if we don't take that requirement to people who want to be saved? Do we really believe it then? Everybody, everybody would want to receive that grace. Everybody would want to receive that. Now, I know that there are some who will, who will say, no, I don't believe that. I know that. But it's not our job to force somebody into believing it. It's our job to offer them the gospel that's been given to us. We have the message of reconciliation. It's been committed to us, and our task is to take it to those who need it. And because they've called on the name of the Lord, because these people have called on the name of the Lord. They've received the Spirit. These people who are prophesying, these people who are speaking in these tongues, they had received the Spirit, and basically what he's saying is, we have received the Spirit, we have called on the name of the Lord, and we've been saved, so now we have the Spirit. And now, I just get this picture. These are all Jewish people who have been serving, who have been prophesying, who have, maybe not even prophesying. They've all been serving and all have been proclaiming the same God. They say they worship the same God. All of these people who are now gathering around to see this sight, To see this big scene, they all believed in the same God. And these few who were gathered here say, we have called on the name of the Lord and we have received the Spirit. Now, if you were one of these other Jewish people who happened to be in town for this festival, and these people over here said they've received the Spirit because they've called on the name of the Lord, but you don't have that Spirit, and that means, in turn, you have not called on the name of the Lord, what would you be thinking? Well, first of all, you'd probably be thinking these people were drunk. But even further than that, you think, why don't I have the Spirit? Why has God not poured the Spirit out on me? Because essentially what that means is they have not called on the name of the Lord. So then the natural question is, who is this Lord on whom you need to call? Who is this Lord? Right? That's how this would flow. In, at least in my mind, that's what would happen. Whom is this Lord? And Peter goes on to explain that that is this Jesus Okay, so the first movement we see here is Peter explaining the Spirit's moving among them. That's movement number one. Movement number two, Peter explains God's plan of the resurrection. 
Peter explains God's plan of the resurrection. And you can see these movements. They're, they're easy to pick out. It's not like I did something brilliant. Verse 22, he starts out again with fellow Israelites. He begins this next section by saying, fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. And with these next two movements, Peter, Peter starts, he starts out to prove that Jesus is this Lord who you have to call on to be saved. That's what he's doing. He's proving that Jesus is the Lord to call on to be saved. Okay? He's showing that he is the Lord, that he's the Messiah, that he's the Son of God, that he literally, we're going to see here in a minute, that he's trying to equate Jesus to Yahweh, the Lord that these Jewish people would have, would have called on. He's saying these are the same people. Jesus is Yahweh. And we'll see that throughout the rest of this, okay? So as he talks about this, he says that Jesus, and he makes it clear, he doesn't want to mistake this Jesus for another Jesus. So he actually says, this Jesus, this one, okay? Not some other Jesus. This Jesus was attested to you. Like he was shown off to you. He was demonstrated to you by miracles and wonders. And all of these people should have known that he did these things. Like you knew that this happened. Peter basically says, look at his life. Look at the things he did. Nobody but God could do those things. Nobody else could have done those things. I mean, literally, there are these things called the messianic miracles, okay? Things that only God himself could have done. Only the Messiah could have done these things. That's, nobody else could do these. No prophet, no priest, nobody else could have done this. All right, and things like healing a leper, because in order to heal somebody, you'd have to touch them. But if you touch a leper, then you become a leper yourself. Nobody could do that except for God himself. Healing a man born blind. Nobody could do that but God himself. Now, if a person had gone blind, then maybe you could heal them. But if they were born blind, no, we see Jesus do that. Things like raising the dead, Jesus does that. So, Jesus literally did things that nobody else could do. And Peter says, look at Jesus' life. He proved it like he was attested to you by these signs and these wonders. You know this. You can see it. It was there in his life. So he points them to things that they knew. Like, you know he did these things. The problem was that a lot of people are thinking at this point as they're around, like, yeah, okay, maybe he did these cool things or we think he did these things, but he was delivered up to die. And could you really do that to the Messiah? Like, you delivered him over to death. Like, we did that. And they say that, he addresses that in verse 23, where he says, Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless men to nail him in, to a cross and to kill him. All right, and I just, this, this is so good. Oh, this is so good, the waiter Peter does this. This is, this is awesome. He shows that this was actually God's intention from the beginning. It was God's determined plan and design. Like, you didn't surprise God by doing this. <laughs> it's not news to him. He knew this was going to happen. This was God's plan A for Jesus to be delivered over to death. It's not like, well, I suppose since they did this, let's just go ahead and, and alter the plan a little bit. So this can be plan B since plan A didn't work like we thought. That's not what happens. He says this was plan A. This was God's determined plan. This was God's design. This is what he intended from the very beginning. He intended to use Jesus' death for our salvation from the very beginning. Like that was his plan. But even though this was God's plan, Peter doesn't let the people off the hook, does he? He doesn't. As a matter of fact, what Peter does is something that a lot of people say preachers shouldn't do. And I think, it's a, I think preachers should do this all the time, but I've heard people say, preachers should not use the dreaded second person. Like say, you did this, or you need to do that. I have heard people say, preachers, you, know, you don't want to make people uncomfortable by saying, you are sinners. I hope people are uncomfortable with their sin. If you're not uncomfortable with your sin, then you've missed the point. Peter doesn't let them off, and he uses that dreaded second person that happens to be in the plural here in his sermon, and he says, you, you all. Now, if we were in Texas, it would say y'all. Y'all use lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. 
And actually, I don't like my translation because while that's pretty strong, I don't think it's strong enough. If you go back to the original language, literally what the word here that uses a second person plural, it is you killed. Like, you all killed him. It makes no, no qualms about it. Like, you did this. That's the word that Peter used. You killed him. But I don't even know that that's strong enough. Because literally what this word is, it's the word annihilate. Like he says, you annihilated Jesus. You did that. Even though it was according to God's determined plan from the very beginning, even though you used lawless people, you killed Jesus. And since Peter got personal, I want to get a little bit personal because his words are still ringing true today. You all killed Jesus. You killed him. He literally died because of you. Because of me. And Peter says, maybe somebody else physically put him on that cross. Maybe somebody else physically hung him there. But you killed him. That's on you. If that doesn't sting a little bit, it, you don't get it. Like, the Son of God came. He was here. He performed these miracles. He loved people like we can't even begin to love people. He healed people from diseases. He saved people for eternity. And we killed him. I killed him. You killed him. I just, I just want that to set in for a minute. Romans 4.25 says, He was delivered up for, literally that for is because of our trespasses and raised for our justification. Like he was delivered up for your sins. That's why he was delivered up. Jesus died because of your sin. He was killed because of your sins, because of my sins, and we are responsible for his death. Just let that set in for a minute. But thank God, thank God that the story doesn't end there. Thank God the story doesn't end there. He goes on, verse 24. He says, God raised him up ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. He goes on to verse 24 and he says, Jesus didn't stay dead for long. Boy, isn't that good news? And he died for you. You may have killed him, but he didn't stay dead long. Oh no, he came back pretty quick. Literally what this says is that he was raised from dead and whenever it says ending the pains of death, Literally, that word pains is labor pains, like birthing pains. That's the word in the Greek. And what he's saying here is through the grave, the grave, Jesus' death somehow brought about some kind of new life. There was something different about this where something was born out of this. It ended the pains of death. That was temporary, but something new has come. And he makes it abundantly clear that death could not hold Jesus. It says that it was impossible for Jesus to be held by death. It was impossible. Now, that's a strange thing to say, isn't it? Anything's impossible for God. It, doesn't, it sounds strange to say something's impossible for the Son of God. No, no, no. It's impossible for him to stay dead. Yeah, that's good news. It was impossible for death to hold him. And because of that, because he was raised from the dead, because it was impossible for death to hold him down, Peter says, he is the Lord on whom we call. Because of that, he is the Lord on whom we call. And then he continues to show that it was God's plan by quoting David here from Psalm 16. It's verses 8 through 11, in case you're curious. This next passage of Scripture that he quotes. He says, I saw the Lord ever before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope because you will not abandon me in Hades or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the paths of life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence. He says, look at what David said. Look at what David said. He said that your flesh will not see decay, that the grave could not hold me. You think David was talking about himself? Of course not. He goes on to prove that he couldn't have been talking about himself because he's still dead and buried. 
is that he had to have been talking about somebody else, and that was Jesus. He pointed us to him. That he would reveal the way to life, the way to his presence. And so he explains God's plan of the resurrection. He points to Jesus' life, and David's testimony is the proof that Jesus was the Messiah that they were looking for. And then we enter into this third movement. After we see him explain the spirits moving among them, he explains God's plan of the resurrection. And finally, he explains Jesus' role as Lord and Messiah. He explains that Jesus is undoubtedly this Lord and Messiah whom they call on. He basically says in verse 29, well, David couldn't have been talking about himself in this psalm. It's impossible because, like I said, we know he's both dead and buried, and his tomb is still with us. Like they, they knew where David was buried. It couldn't have been him that he was talking about. He was talking about somebody else. But David, he says, knew that God's promise was good. He was a prophet. He knew it was good. And because of that, because he knew that God's promise was good, he said these things in the psalm about the Messiah that was to come. And that was Jesus. He says it in verse 32. He says, God raised this Jesus. This Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. He says, we know that Jesus has been raised. We are all witnesses of this. I can almost see Peter standing here with these, with these Jewish people all gathered around like, the Messiah that we've all been waiting for, the Lord that we've all been waiting for to be saved by, the one that we've all been waiting for, we know, like we saw this Jesus, and he, I can almost see him motioning to the 100, 120 people that are with him here at Pentecost. I can almost see him like, we witnessed this. Like we saw this Jesus raised from the dead. We know that this Jesus is alive, and he's the one that end, end the pains of death. He's the one. And we know that there was a bunch of people that saw this. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6 says that over 500 people saw the resurrected Jesus. And many of those people who seen the resurrected Jesus were still alive when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, which means at this point they were certainly still alive and they were all gathered around. We see that people knew, they were witnesses that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And then in verse 33 he says, basically since, since Jesus is a, was risen and he has ascended to the right hand of God, he has sent or poured out the Spirit on us. It says, because Jesus has taken this place of honor and power next to God, he has poured the Spirit out on us as the Lord. He has the right to do that thing. And at this point, these Jewish people should have received, had all the proof they needed to agree that Jesus was the Lord and the Messiah. That would have been all the proof that they should have needed because he said, look at Jesus' life, look at David's testimony, look at people's testimony, like we saw this Jesus. And he says, look, the Spirit's here. If the Spirit's here, that means that the Messiah must have come. He says, look at this. You have all the proof you need. He says, David never ascended to heaven. He had to have been pointing to another Lord. He quotes again from Psalms. He points to a Psalm 110. In the next section, in verses 34 and 35, he says, For it was not David who ascended into heavens, but he himself says, The Lord declared to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Okay, so if his Lord declares to the Lord, who is his Lord? Hey, I'll just tell you it's Jesus. This isn't a difficult test. Jesus is the Lord that he's pointing to. David says that there's one who's coming that is greater. My Lord will declare to my Lord. He is the Lord. And all of it culminates then in verse 36. He says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Basically, what he's saying is, since you have proof, you can know that Jesus, this Jesus, who we are talking about, that Jesus, yeah, the one that you all killed, the same Jesus, he is Lord. In the Greek, the word is kurios, but... What he's doing is he's tying this together with the first, the first, first scripture he quoted from Joel, where he said, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, and Joel, that's the word Yahweh. What he's doing here is he's tying Jesus back to that Lord. He's saying Jesus is that Lord on whom we call. God has made him Lord, and he is the Messiah. 
And you can know this with certainty, beyond doubt. Like if we were in the court of law, you could prove that Jesus was the Messiah, that he is God. A lot of Christians are scared, which I think is a huge mistake. A lot of Christians are scared that people are going to start asking them questions and like, how do I prove that Jesus is the Son of God? Like, well, you can't. I disagree. I think you can. How much proof do you need? What Peter says here is you can know with certainty. Like, you can prove Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the Lord, that He is the Messiah, that He's the one that we've been waiting on to be saved from our sins. He's the one, and we can know it. So in these three movements, Peter explains the Spirit's moving among them. He explains God's plan for the resurrection. He explains Jesus' role as Lord and Messiah. Well, so what? Okay, so we know all that. So Peter had this sermon. All right, I promise you four exhortations, okay? I want to give you four exhortations as a result of this sermon. First of all, grab a hold of your calling. Grab a hold of your calling. That's what we see Peter do. Peter here has been called to be the rock on which the church is going to be built. Jesus told him, you will be. And here, Peter grabs a hold of that calling and being empowered by the Spirit fulfills that calling. He goes and he does what God has commanded him, what Jesus has commanded him to do. And out of every single person in this place, Peter was probably the one with the most excuses not to do what Jesus had told him to do. Right? Peter probably had more excuses than anybody. Probably, uh, certainly more than me. I think about Peter's life, and man, he, he rejected Jesus. He did all these crazy, impulsive things. I mean, when Jesus was being arrested, he wasn't loving these people. He went over and cut ears off. Uh, this is Peter. This is that guy. He could have easily said, no, I'm not good enough. No, I'm not qualified. No, I'm too ashamed to do this. But Peter clings to his calling, knowing that God has sent his spirit to supernaturally empower him to go and do this. You and I, in order to fulfill our calling, you don't have to be the best Christian in the world. You don't have to be the smartest person in the world. You don't have to have no shame. You don't have to have your life figured out. Instead, what you have to do is say yes. Boy, that's pretty simple, isn't it? Here I am, Lord, send me. Take a hold of the calling that God has laid on your life. And in case you're not sure what that looks like, some of you say, well, I don't have the details of what God's called me to figured out. Well, I would say start with the things that you know God has called you to. And he's commissioned all believers. Matthew 28 says, go and make disciples. Baptize, teach. We've all been commanded to do that. So if you're not sure exactly where it is that God's led you, start with what you know God has called you to. Grab a hold of the calling that God has placed on your life. Number two, know the scriptures. Exhortation number two, know the scriptures. Okay, the Holy Spirit will guide you as you study. Look, I don't ever, if I ever claim to be the smartest person in the world, just ask my wife, she'll tell you that's not true. I'm not the smartest person in the world. I don't want to pretend to be. But what I do know is that as I study the scriptures, if I trust God, he will guide me and he will lead me. He will do the same for you. He will guide you through the scriptures. And I would also like to encourage you, please don't be that person who says, well, the Bible says that God's going to give me the words to speak in that moment, so I don't really need to study the Bible because God's going to give me the words to speak whenever I need them anyway. Oh, that's the worst argument I, I've heard. Okay, it's terrible. Please don't be that person. I'm begging you, please don't be that person. Yes, God will give you the words to speak, but maybe the way he's going to do that is by guiding you in Scripture to the words that you need to speak. Allow God to lead you in the Scriptures. Don't be the person who just wants to wing it because God makes himself known through the power of the Spirit in his word. He makes himself known through the Spirit. Now, there's a lot of different... A lot of different groups within Christianity who almost want to separate God's word from the spirit. And it's, it's silly, okay? It's not like you have God's spirit over here and the word over here. No, no, no. What the Bible teaches is that God's spirit will drive you deeper into the word. And the word will teach you who the spirit is. 
You learn one as you dive into the other. If you are closer with the Spirit, if you have the Spirit living in you, you will be driven deeper into the Word. If As you drive deeper in the Word, you'll know the Spirit more because you'll see Him alive and a work in you. The two are not exclusive. They are together. They are joined. So know the Scriptures. Trust God to do that. And as you do, pick up this book. Pick up your Bible, open it up, begin to read, begin to study, begin to meditate, begin to memorize Scripture. Know it. Like, breathe it. One of the things I told Steph, I was talking to somebody here a while back, and I haven't got their permission to say their name. But as they were talking, they just, like, Scripture just kept coming up and coming up and coming up. And I said, I want Scripture to flow out of me the way it did him. Like, I want that. So know the scriptures, meditate on the scriptures, study God's word, okay? Number three, exhortation number three, explain the scriptures. Not only do I want you to know the scriptures, I I exhort you, please, explain the scriptures. We look and see what Peter did here, and now just before I talk about what Peter did, just remember the result of what Peter does is 3,000 people coming to a new understanding of who God is, knowing God and being saved, calling on the name of the Lord, and 3,000 people are saved and baptized to this day. Okay, But what does Peter do that brings this about? Peter explains the Scriptures. Peter explains the Scriptures, so I exhort you, explain the Scriptures. The majority of this sermon is Scripture. The majority of it is Scripture. And he just explains what's going on by using the Scriptures. Not all that long ago, I heard a Christian man in the media. He was, he has his own show. Um, I don't want to bash him because I'm sure some of you, some of you probably watch him. But he was debating an open atheist. I don't even remember what they were debating. But this atheist says, "Well, how do you reconcile what it says back in the in Leviticus, where it says that you're supposed to kill your neighbor if they work on the Sabbath?" And this Christian man is like, I, I, "Well, that was the Old Testament." Oh, and my heart sank. Like, no. Basically, what he was doing was functionally divorcing himself from the Old Testament. But the truth is that the Old Testament is every bit as much of our Bible as the New Testament. They are not separated. It's still God's word to man. And it's foolish to try to separate ourselves from it. He failed to be able to, in his ability, to explain the Scriptures. And what Peter does here is he actually shows that Jesus, that the same Jesus that this Christian broadcaster claims to serve, is alive in the Old Testament. Like, all three of these passages are Old Testament passages because at this point there wasn't a New Testament. And he's still showing Jesus in the Scriptures. Peter points him back to the Old Testament. He points to the Scriptures and he says, Jesus died for you because of you. And he was raised winning victory over death because death could not hold him. And he did that both because of and for you. He did that both because of and for you. And if you call on his name, you will be saved. Peter explains the scriptures, and I would exhort you to do the same. Exhortation number four, and this one might be the most obvious, call on the name of the Lord. Call on the name of the Lord. The truth is, the Bible explains that we have all strayed from God, that we have all turned our back on Him, that we are all guilty of sin. Everybody knows in Romans where it says all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. The Bible teaches that we are all sinners in need of God's grace. And because we are guilty before an infinitely holy God, we will be infinitely separated from God forever if we remain in that state. But, but, you can be saved from that. And the way to do it is simple. Here they say, call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says, have faith in the Son of God. It's the same thing. (laughs) Place your faith in Jesus. Call on the name of the Lord. Turn to him as your Lord, as your Savior. He is the answer. So here in a moment, I'm going to invite you. I know I offered an invitation last week. Well, we're going to do it again today. I don't know if we have any music queued up that we could sing or anything. I haven't talked to the guys, so sorry for springing that on you. But here in a minute, I'd like to sing and I'd like to invite you. And if you have never taken that first step, if you have never placed that saving faith in Jesus, if you have never said, he is the Lord, I would encourage you, I I urge you, I, I, I exhort you 
to call on the name of the Lord. I would love to have that conversation with you. I'd love to pray with you. I would love to talk to you about what that means. So here in a moment, we're going to sing. And if you have never taken that step, I would encourage you to do so. But also, if you have never publicly recognized Jesus as your Lord through baptism, if you have never done that, if you have never followed him as a follower of Jesus said, I want to publicly identify myself as his I would encourage you to come. I would love to pray with you. I'd love to talk about, talk about that with you. And I would love to, love to just help you take the right steps in that direction. So as we sing, I would invite you to literally stand up. If you are that person, to literally stand up, walk up here. And I would love to talk with you and pray with you and see how we can move forward together. Let's pray together. Lord God, I, I praise you today that you have given us such a good Lord, such a good God to call on to be saved. Lord, and I thank you that you've made it simple for us. Lord, as I told, as I mentioned just a minute ago, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but Lord, you don't make this difficult. God, it's not hard to understand. So Lord, I pray that you would help each person in this room today to call on your name to look to you for their salvation, to recognize that we're sinners. God, help us to see that we were guilty of killing Jesus. Help us to see that we were guilty of placing him on the cross. God, but even more than that, that he was raised on our behalf and that that we we can be united with him in that resurrection through faith. So Lord, I pray, I pray that today that you would soften hearts, that you would call many to yourself. Lord, I help, I, I pray that you would help us that you would help us to identify with you in baptism, that you would give us the strength, the courage, everything it takes to do that. So Lord, be with us now as we sing. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.